Welcome everybody. My name is Grażyna Augustik. I am the founder and president of the Sounds and Notes Foundation, non-for-profit organization based in Chicago. We are delighted to present the fifth annual Chopin in the City Festival, even during this pandemic, which hasn't changed our commitments to maintain our mission to create opportunities that inspire and connect diverse national and international artists, musicians, through collaborative concerts, festivals, workshops, and educational programs. Being connected with music is more important now than ever. While we can't see you in person, we hope you will be able to enjoy the online festival. Since all the concerts are free, we welcome any donation you can give at this time. I would like to make a moment to thank all of you for your support and acknowledge our main sponsors, Professor Jan Kulczycki, Polish Slavic Federal Credit Union, ICG Rehab Services, Dr. Cornelia Król, Dr. Ewa and Dariusz Boris, Paweł Struzyński Amadeus Restaurant, Rennes Art Foundation. This program is partially supported by a grant from Consulate General of the Republic of Poland in Chicago and Illinois Arts Council Agency. Without your contribution and generosity, this festival would not have happened. A very special thank you to Polish Museum of America in Chicago, a largest Polish ethnic museum in America, for providing your space as our venue for the past five years. And now, without further ado, welcome Patricia Stempniak, the founder of Patricia Arts Studio. She invited a few of her students representing her studio who will paint inspired by the live music and storytelling by Chicago-owned Svetlana Belsky, highly regarded performer, chamber pianist, recording artist, and scholars. The concert was possible thanks to Polish-American Roman Catholic Union Live. Please enjoy a concert and come back for more. Tomorrow, we will have the last day of the festival. We will have concerts from Polish National Radio in Warsaw, Poland, with Royal String Quartet. For a detailed schedule of the festival and donation, please visit our website, soundsandnotes.org or shoppeninthecity.com. I'm so very excited to paint, paint Chopin with my students for a fifth time with, during the Chopin in the City Festival. It's a great experience for all of us. As um, Mrs. Mrs. Grzyna told before, we used to paint in the huge company. Last year we painted over 100 people together in this beautiful place. I would like to thank you, PRC Way, for being a great host for, us, for all of us. and. Um, I'm, I'm grateful I, we can present during this festival, during our concert painting Chopin, this beautiful place as we have um, Polish Museum of America. I, would, I, I hope you are going to enjoy the concert and you are going to paint with us and you will find some inspiration for your future work. Um, I'm glad you are here. I would like to say hi for all people who are watching us right now and have fun guys enjoy create be happy create memories create your beautiful art thank you very much um, as well i would like to invite all of you for my very first um, movie animated movie i created for the um, festival purpose it's the fully wrote by me on the um, I would like to create an inspiration for my students and for the people around the world. I would like to show how beautiful and endless music can be in our life. Um, we, I believe we even have no idea how important it is for us every day, every moment of the life. So um, I, 
I would like to and make you happy with this movie. Enjoy every second, I hope so. And have fun, guys. I am so very happy to be in this beautiful space again where I feel that art inspires music and music inspires art. So I look forward to sharing with you guys some of my favorite pieces, um, pieces that inspire visions in me. And I really look forward to seeing what sort of visions they inspire in, in you and look forward to uh, seeing you put them on paper. So we're going to start where all pianists always start, which is with Chopin, of course, our favorite composer. You guys probably know uh, that Chopin is the most, Polish, the most famous Polish composer, but he spent half of his life away from Poland. When he was just about 20 years old, he left to go visit France, and just uh, a few months after he went for his trip, this was 1830, 1830 a big year, there was a big uprising in Poland. Poland tried to get its independence, and it failed. And um, the, the Russian Empire occupied Poland again, and the government became more repressive, and it became more and more impossible to live there, so Chopin stayed in Paris. Um, but he never became French, not really. He continued to think of himself as a Polish composer, and he wrote a lot of music that was based on his good memories of his homeland. Among those pieces, some of the most famous are his uh, mazurkas. So, do you guys know what a mazurka is? It's a Polish dance. Basically, it's a dance in three that goes yum, pa, pam, 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 pa, pam, pam. Um, there are slow mazurkas, there are fast mazurkas, there are happy ones, there are sad ones. Some of them you can dance to, other, one, uh, other ones you cannot. Um, and they come in all varieties. So I will play you two different ones, and I'll tell you a little bit about what I think about both of them. The first one I'll play um, is one of Chopin's earliest pieces. So he's about 20 years old when he wrote it. So think about that kind of genius. I know 20 is old for you guys, but for the rest of us, <laughs> that's like really, really young. A composer just starting out. So when I hear this particular mazurka, you know what I imagine? A beautiful ballroom with lots of candles and women in gorgeous gowns and handsome gentlemen in army officer outfits and everybody's dancing and everybody's very proud and happy to be there. But I want you to listen, there's one cool little spot, you'll hear something like this. Doesn't sound dancey at all. So I want you to think what you think happens there. I'll tell you what I think. Sometimes I think it's somebody just looking out the window and thinking about something else. Other times I think the person may be dancing but remembering something that happened. But when I'm really in the mood, what I think is two people meet for the first time and they dance and they look into each other eyes and time just stands still. So let's start with this one. This is, as I said, one of Chopin's earliest compositions, Mazurka Opus 7, number one.
Thanks. So now I'll play another mazurka. And this one is as different as two mazurkas can be. It also happens to be my favorite piece of Chopin, I think. On some days. But certainly my favorite mazurka. I don't think you can dance to this one at all. This one is all about being sad to be away from home, I think. You guys have ever been away from home? So you know what it's like. You remember all the good stuff. And it's kind of a sweet feeling, but you kind of do wish you were there again. So see what you think. So, thank you, thank you. It makes me want to cry every time I 
play it or hear it. So if you feel like that, you know, be my guest. However, we deserve something very happy and very funny now. So we do a, a completely different kind of dance. So what I'm going to play for you is a little piece by Edvard Grieg, a Norwegian composer. Um, he was very good about um, fairy tale kinds of things. So this one is called Puck. So Puck, of course, is a, a fairy, um, you know, a, a little imp. Um, in some stories, he is naughty. In some stories, he's nice. So I'll play and I'll see, and you guys can decide which one. But funny, no matter what. Let's, let's stick to Greek and magical creatures for one more piece. This next one is called March of the Dwarfs or March of the Trolls in different translations. Um, either way, they are uh, funny sort of trolls. So the, the piece is in three parts. You'll hear the guy trolls in the first part and the last part. But in the middle part, I think it's the girl trolls um, doing something very pretty and very nice. I think they're very pretty kind of trolls. See what you think.
Thank you. Hopefully nobody was frightened, right? So let's do another march now. Uh, probably the most famous march of all, the Turkish march by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. So this, this one um, deserves a little bit of a backstory. So Turkey was called the Ottoman Empire in its day, and it was at war with the Austrian Empire for many years, for, um, for almost 100 years actually, and it was a terrible, terrible war. But finally, in 1699, a peace agreement was reached. And obviously that was a very happy day, and a huge Turkish delegation came to Vienna, and they brought with them not just the diplomats, uh, but they brought a troop of Janissaries who were the Turkish um, soldiers in outlandish uniforms, like all oh, handsome, huge sabers, huge mustaches, just really fun to look at. And that troop also brought with them their military band. Um, and so there were a lot of parades uh, with the handsome soldiers marching down the streets with uh, that military band playing with huge drums and piccolos and just excitement all around. And of course, Mozart enjoyed hearing it as much as anyone else. And he uh, used what he heard in his famous Turkish march. So as you listen to it, see if you hear the big drum and if you can hear the people marching and even the piccolos. Like, you know, those little teeny tiny flutes that just shriek up there. So, one of the funnest pieces ever written for the piano.
things, guys. As I said, one of the funnest things uh, written, written for the piano. So, um, as most people know, that Chopin was very ill and died at a young age because he had tuberculosis. So nowadays, he just gets some penicillin, but um, back in that time, the only treatment that doctors could recommend was go sit on a beach somewhere, be in a sunny climate. So um, towards the end of his life, Chopin's friend um, dragged him kind of against his will on what was supposed to be a beautiful vacation to the sunny island of Mallorca. Um, but there was a problem. There was no sun. It rained. It rained the entire month they were there. Uh, Chopin wrote some of his most marvelous music on that vacation. But a lot of that music feels to me like you can hear and feel and taste and smell the rain. So um, among the many masterpieces he composed in Mallorca were his set of 24 short pieces called preludes. Don't worry, I'm not going to play all 24. I'm just going to play two little ones. But in both of them, um, the, to quote a song, see all the colors of the rain. Because that, that's definitely what I see. So what color was that, right? And uh, let me do one more from the same set. I still hear the rain and I still hear the grayness within, within that rainbow that Chopin always evokes from the piano.
I know, it breaks your heart, doesn't it? Such beauty, and yet. So, but let's stick to the subject of water, but in, in happier, sort of bluer ways. Although, maybe not for the next one, because the next piece I'm going to play is called the Venetian Boat Song. So, for people who have been to Venice, know that it's an absolutely magical place. Um, it's built basically on water. Uh, there's nowhere really to walk. All the streets are canals. So it, it doesn't smell particularly magical, judging by my last trip. But um, if you just close your nose, uh, it's, it's beyond belief gorgeous there. So if you are an efficient kind of tourist like me, you get either on a nice motorized water taxi or uh, a water ferry. But if you are romantic, that what you really do in Venice, you get into this kind of boat called a gondola, which has got like a really high in the front, really high in the back. And there's a gondolier um, who doesn't just drive the boat or push the boat, really. He also sings. Sometimes he sings opera. Sometimes uh, he will sing you know, Italian folk songs. Sometimes uh, he'll sing uh, you know, Lady Gaga, well, whatever he's paid for. But traditionally, he sings um, traditional Italian music. So the way that boat works is he basically has just one oar. So he pushes uh, against the, the bottom of the canal, and the boat moves. So in this piece by Felix Mendelssohn, I want to show you how Mendelssohn portrays the movement of the boat, which is, I think is kind of genius stuff. So you can hear, he, he pushes and the boat sways on the water. He pushes and the boat sways on the water. So um, Venetian Boat Song, Opus 19, number six, from Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words. Although, of course, anybody who listens is very welcome to come up with their own words. Was able to see the boat in, in, in your mind, right? So the, the next song is by Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, and it's also about boats. And in fact, it's so related that I just had to do these two next to each other. This is the very famous Barcarolle, which is the portrayal of the month of June from Tchaikovsky's Seasons. And Barcarolle, of course, means a song about boats. And you'll hear the boat portrayed very much the same way as Mendelssohn does. But the song is more complex. So you'll hear somebody singing. You'll hear maybe two people singing. Or maybe it's a reflection of the singer in the water. I don't know. And then there's a really wonderful middle section 
which is in a major key. It seems like a dance, but really my own feeling is somebody just rocks the boat. I mean, literally. Um, the, the whole thing feels like it's going to fall off. And then the beautiful song returns. And this time, sometimes there are two uh, uh, singers again. Sometimes there are three or even more. You can imagine all kinds of stuff. And certainly this is one of the prettiest songs ever written.
So those of you taking piano lessons, if you practice very hard and don't annoy your teacher, this may be in your future. The next piece, however, is probably not uh, for a student, no matter how advanced. It's still about water, though. This one is a prelude by the French composer Claude Debussy. It's called Le Colline de Capri, pardon my French, which means the hills of Anacapri, an Italian island. Apparently, uh, Debussy had never seen the island, or really hadn't been anywhere, hadn't seen anything, and he was inspired by a picture, which happened to be a label on a wine bottle, but that portrayed this beautiful island in the middle of the blue sea. And what you can really hear in this piece is you can see the sun on the water. You can see waves splashing against rocks. You can hear a singer just singing somewhere on the beach, a beautiful song, uh, but everywhere the sound of water. And I just, to me, what I see is sunshine. Um, I mean, I love Italy. There is no more beautiful place on earth. Um, to me, as soon as the quarantine is up, I am so on the first plane to anywhere, drop the needle in Italy, don't care where. Um, so this is as close as I get to come, and all of us get to come for the time being. So Claude Debussy, Le Colline de Capri.
So this, to me, that's like the most fun ending of any piece where you get to just punch it. So I'm literally seeing waves water break against a rock in the water and um, with the sun reflected on it. So our last water piece, next one, is also by Debussy. Um, but this one has no sun, it has the moon. It's the famous Claire de Lune that all of you have heard, even if you don't know it by name, you've heard it in movies and commercials and whatnot. And even though water is not in the name, that's where I see some still lake or river or something, and moon deflected. When you listen to the beginning, listen to how the melody seems to just gently drop. It's almost as if you can see uh, the moon deflected in the waves coming down. It's the most magical thing. It's really gorgeous and I hope you all love it.
Thanks. So I think Debussy is probably the most visual of all composers. He really paints a picture. You can put whatever you want in it, but you, you can almost smell the colors, right? So enough with the water, though. So the last set of pieces I'd like to play, totally unrelated except that they are, are um, about an instrument, a harp. Of course, harp is usually used to portray water, so we're still kind of in that subject. But I'd like to play uh, a prelude called The Harp uh, by a very young Sergei Prokofiev. So Prokofiev uh, was, of course, one of the most uh, famous Russian and then Soviet composers. Um, in his young, uh, young age, when he was in conservatory, what he was famous for the most was that he, kicked out, he was kicked out of the conservatory. Um, not for uh, bad behavior, for the stuff that he wrote. So uh, judging by my own experience as a mother, most kids uh, think that they're smarter than their professors. This was one of those cases where that really was true. You know, so Prokofi was so much more talented and became so very much more famous. So um, the piece that I'm going to play is from this, that period where Prokofi was experimenting with revolutionary new styles, even though this piece is just sweet. Um, it's a wonderful portrayal of, of a harp, a little bit with, um, you know, one's tongue a little bit in one's cheek, but nothing to get kicked out of the conservatory for. So harp prelude. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't that a really fun portrayal of a harp? So let's end today with another portrayal of a harp. And of course we have to come back to Chopin. And so I'm going to end with Chopin's uh, first etude from his Opus 25. Um, uh, Chopin refused to give any of his pieces uh, descriptive names, uh, but this one was given, I think, by a publisher and stuck. This one is called the Aeolian Harp. So, for, uh, for those of you who might not know what an Aeolian harp is, because it's an imaginary thing, it's a harp that sits in a tree. And so no human hand touches it, uh, wind blows through it, and makes the strings vibrate. 
So the harp is being played by the wind. Um, I, let me assure you that this etude is not being played by the wind, and it has a gazillion notes, all of them uh, being played by you know, the poor, long-suffering pianist, except this piece is so beautiful um, that it, it's a joy to suffer. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am very happy of all the things that we have drawn. It, everybody's so creative. No matter who you are, you will always do something that will make you proud of yourself. And today, I am so thankful that I was one of the six that could have come here and draw something about Chopin. And thank you so much. I love drawing, and it's one of my favorite things to do. And, and yes. play piano, of course, and play as we piano. discussed. Yes. Let's, let's not forget <laughs> the things. Thank you so much one more time. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Abby, would you like to share something? I really like painting, and I always liked painting, um, and I always liked painting when I was four, and... Everything I painted used to come to life, and now it just comes to life all the time. It just makes me really happy that I'm here, and I, re I really, really, really love abstract art. So my Chopin art was inspired by abstract art. Would you like to say what have you painted today? What, what is the special place you painted today? I painted where Chopin was born, oh, it was piano. Awesome.